The point of this video is to illustrate five different projections of the sphere to the plane, and then in the second part, five completely analogous projections of the so-called hyperbolic plane. I'll try to emphasize the similarities between spherical or elliptic geometry and hyperbolic geometry. Let me start with a simple segment showing a rotating sphere, because that is the simplest to visualize. This projection is known as the orthographic projection. It corresponds to viewing the sphere from infinitely far away so that exactly one hemisphere is visible. Although it is rarely used by cartographers to represent the Earth because it distorts both shapes and sizes, it does have one advantage, namely that the brain is very good at recognizing a spherical shape projected this way. The pattern on the sphere consists of 12 regular pentagons of the same size, and it is known as a dodecahedron. Now if you think of a dodecahedron as a regular solid with flat sides in Euclidean 3 space, the relationship between the two is that if one inscribes the regular solid inside a sphere and then blows it out to completely fill the sphere, in other words if one projects the edges and vertices onto the sphere from its center, then one obtains this pattern, which is a tiling of the sphere by 12 regular pentagons. Now let's switch to a different projection of the same pattern on the same sphere. What we see here is known as the gnomonic projection of the sphere, or sometimes the central perspective. One way to describe it is as follows. Imagine the sphere is translucent and we put a light bulb in the center and a screen in front. Then the projection onto the screen will be the gnomonic projection. Equivalently, we can just think of it as viewing the sphere from its center, except that in this case it rotates in the opposite direction. This projection has the essentially unique property that it preserves alignment. In other words, lines on the sphere become lines in the projection. Lines on the sphere refer to great circles, or what navigators call orthodromies. They are the intersection of the sphere with a plane through its center. This is why they become straight lines in this projection. Many people think that it's impossible to map the Earth to a flat surface while keeping straight lines as straight lines, but the gnomonic projection does exactly this. On the other hand, because it only projects one hemisphere, and even then by distorting it pretty badly, it's rarely used in cartography. One of the other videos on my YouTube channel shows what it's like to travel through a 120 cell, which is a regular polytope in Euclidean 4 space, or a tiling of the 3 sphere by dodecahedra. Here we are seeing the exact analog, but one dimension lower. The next projection is stereographic projection, and is probably most mathematicians' favorite. It's also used by cartographers when mapping the polar regions. Instead of projecting the sphere from the center of the sphere, as in gnomonic projection, this time we project from a point on the sphere. This is why we get the impression that we're viewing the sphere from just below the surface. Unlike gnomonic projection, stereographic projection maps the entire sphere, minus the point from which we're projecting, which gets sent to infinity in all directions. This projection is interesting in that it is conformal, which means that it preserves angles measured on the sphere, or that it does not distort small shapes. It can increase or decrease sizes locally, but for a given point it will use the same scale factor in every direction. This is the reason why at every vertex of the dodecahedron, a point where three pentagons meet, they meet at equal angles of 2 pi over 3 or 120 degrees. Note that this is more than the 108 degrees of a Euclidean pentagon, reflecting the fact that the sphere is positively curved. Now stereographic projection has the additional property, besides being conformal, that it preserves circles. In other words, the projection of a circle on the sphere including a line or great circle, will be a circle or line in the plane. So both the edges of the dodecahedron pattern and also the circles which I inscribed in every pentagon become circles in the projection. The center of the circle, however, is not conserved by the projection. All the projections in this video are what are known as azimuthal projections. This means that there is a point, called the center of projection, which is always in the exact center of the screen, such that straight lines through this point get projected to straight lines with the same angle. In other words, the bearing from this point is preserved by projection. The stereographic projection which we just saw can be described as the unique azimuthal projection which preserves angles. The one we have here can be described as the unique azimuthal projection which preserves areas. It is the Lambert azimuthal equal area projection. Unlike the orthographic projection which only shows one hemisphere, this one shows the entire sphere, so the antipodal point of the center of projection is transformed to a circle which is the boundary of the projection. Since the 12 pentagons are congruent on the sphere, they have the same area, and this projection maps them to regions of equal area. This is why they seem to push each other around as they move. They get flattened, 
while keeping the same overall area. If they seem to get larger, this is an optical illusion. The brain tends to overestimate the area of flattened shapes, because when we see a flattened shape in real life, it's generally a large object viewed from an angle. This is the reason why I'm not a great fan of equal area projections in cartography. They might preserve the true area, but they don't preserve the subjective impression we have of area. The last projection I'll show for the sphere is the azimuthal equidistant projection. It is a compromise between stereographic projection, which enlarges objects away from the center so as to preserve their shapes, and azimuthal equal area, which compresses them so as to preserve their total area. This projection preserves both the bearing and the distance from the center point, so it is obtained by simply mapping distance and bearing to the polar coordinates of the projection. This is the projection used on the UN flag from the North Pole. Of course, this projection only preserves the distance to the center, not arbitrary distances, and doesn't have really nice properties, so it's rarely used by mathematicians or by cartographers. This concludes my tour of the five most common azimuthal projections of the sphere, and I will now proceed to illustrate five exactly analogous azimuthal projections of the hyperbolic plane, but in a slightly different order. I want to emphasize that every segment in the first part and every second in the second part shows exactly the same pattern, doing exactly the same rotation with exactly the same center point, and only the projection changes from one segment to the next. I start the second part with a hyperbolic analog of stereographic projection, because this is the most frequently used representation of the hyperbolic plane, so frequent in fact that some people take it to be completely synonymous with it, and forget that, exactly as in the case of a sphere, other projections are possible. This is known as the Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane. It is famous through Escher's prints titled Circle Limit. Like stereographic projection of the sphere, it is conformal, meaning that it preserves angles and small shapes. Also like stereographic projection, it is azimuthal and maps circles to circles, but does not preserve their centers. Unlike stereographic projection of the sphere, this one maps the entire space to a disk, whose edge is the so-called circle at infinity or circle of ideal points. Unlike the sphere, which can be seen as a simple shape in Euclidean three-dimensional space, the hyperbolic plane cannot be easily embedded in Euclidean space. So we have to understand it through its projections, and the Poincaré disk model is a good one to start. The lines of the hyperbolic plane in the Poincaré disk projection correspond to Euclidean arcs of circle, which are orthogonal to the circle of infinity at both edges. The figure we have here is a regular tiling of the hyperbolic plane by regular heptagons, all of the same size. This is in many ways analogous to the dodecahedral tiling of the sphere by regular pentagons which we saw in the first part, but this time there is an infinite number of heptagons. This time the angle of 120 degrees at each vertex is less than 129 degrees which we would expect from Euclidean heptagon, and this illustrates the fact that the hyperbolic plane is negatively curved. The overall movement we see is a hyperbolic translation. In the spherical case there was no difference between rotation and translation. A rotation of the sphere around a polar axis is the same as a translation along the corresponding equator. In the ordinary Euclidean plane, of course, translations and rotations are different, but translations are merely a limit case of rotations when the center goes to infinity and the angle becomes smaller. In hyperbolic geometry, translations and rotations are truly different, and you can tell that this is a translation because it preserves two ideal points, namely, the one from which the heptagons seem to be emerging and the one to which the heptagons seem to be converging. The axis, or equator of translation, is the hyperbolic line connecting these points. It will be more apparent in the next projection. This projection is the hyperbolic analog of the gnomonic projection of the sphere. It is known as the Beltrami-Klein model of the hyperbolic plane. Like the gnomonic projection of the sphere, this has the essentially unique property of preserving straight lines, but it preserves neither angles nor areas. The ideal points, in other words the points on the circle at infinity, are projected exactly as in the Poincaré disk model, but this time the line connecting two of them is just a Euclidean line, so the axis of translation is quite obvious in this segment, it is a horizontal line a bit below the center of the disk. The entire hyperbolic plane is visible on this figure, except that it gets completely squashed at the edges of the disk, so it's much less obvious than in the case of the Poincaré disk model. Although this projection is the analog of the gnomonic projection of the sphere, it has some resemblance with the orthographic projection. This is probably the reason why it resembles a sphere being rotated, but of course it isn't. This projection is also of interest in special relativity, 
The reason is that the space of velocities of a massive object in special relativity naturally has the structure of a hyperbolic space. The value of the velocity is seen as the distance to the origin in the Beltrami-Klein model. Composition of velocities functions like translations of hyperbolic space, and the circle at infinity is the speed of light. The reason it cannot be reached it is in the hyperbolic sense it is at infinity. Now one shouldn't get the impression that the hyperbolic plane is small because the Poincaré and Beltrami-Klein projections represent it as the inside of a disk. The projection in the segment, which I'll call pseudo-orthographic for lack of a better name, maps the hyperbolic plane to the whole Euclidean plane. Just like the previous one was analogous to the gnomonic projection of the sphere but visually resembled the orthographic projection, this one is analogous to the orthographic projection of the sphere but visually resembles the gnomonic projection. It doesn't have any nice properties, apart from being azimuthal like all the others. It doesn't preserve lines, angles, or areas, but it is mathematically quite natural. I pointed out that the hyperbolic plane cannot be embedded in Euclidean 3 space. It can, however, be embedded in Lorentzian 3 space as one sheet of a two-sheeted hyperboloid of revolution. This is known as the Weierstrass model of the hyperbolic plane, and the projection shown here is simply the orthogonal projection of the hyperboloid to the plane of symmetry between the two sheets. The penultimate projection is analogous to Lambert azimuthal equal area for the sphere, and there's no reason not to call it Lambert azimuthal equal area projection of the hyperbolic plane. It is the unique projection which is azimuthal and preserves hyperbolic area. Again, every heptagon has the same size as all the others, so here it gets projected to region of equal area. This explains why they appear to move by pushing around each other. Finally, we have the azimuthal equidistant projection, which is simply obtained by mapping distance and bearing from the central point to the polar coordinates of the projection. The nice thing about this projection is that because it is so crowded, it illustrates how maze-like the hyperbolic plane is. If you move a few steps away from any given heptagon, you can find yourself in a huge and exponentially growing number of different heptagons, vastly spaced apart. This also makes it clear that the circumference of a circle in the hyperbolic plane grows exponentially with its radius. Or, if you want, then in the hyperbolic plane, two people starting from the same point at the same speed but in slightly different directions will diverge exponentially from one another. This is an illustration of negative curvature, in contrast to the positively curved sphere where the two trajectories will meet again in the antipode of their starting point.